infinite complacence, people went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Welcome to another episode of Into the Fray. If you're new here, I hope you're enjoying it enough to head to your podcatcher of choice to rate and review the show. This helps it aggregate across the listening platforms, which will turn into more people willing to come on and share their encounters. If you've been listening for years, I'd ask that you please do the same. Home base for Into the Fray is intothefrayradio.com. There you will find all episodes, blog posts, and get bonus content info. Speaking of that bonus content, on top of the free weekly show, I also produce bonus content for Patreon and Apple Podcasts Premium. On either platform, you get all bonus audio episodes and early releases, each one ad-free, of course. Full disclosure though, Patreon has a bit more in the way of perks because of their interface. Over there, you will get video versions of patron-only chats, the private Discord channel, and merch at certain pledge levels. So head to patreon.com slash into the fray or your Apple Podcatcher app to sign up for bonus content today. You can find me on the big three social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The Linktree link in each of my bios will take you to all the places you want to venture regarding ITF, including small town monsters documentaries, various ways to listen to the show, Beyond the Fray books, contact info for me, and more. And lastly, and really honestly, most importantly, if you'd like to share your encounter or encounters on Into the Fray, the best way to get in touch is by emailing me at shannon at intothefrayradio.com. And without further ado, let's get to the interview. So on this episode of Into the Fray, I welcome Fred Roll on with me. He is out of Alaska. His website is subarcticalaskasasquatch.com. He also has a YouTube channel under the same name, Subarctic Alaska Sasquatch. He is a member of the Kurung Tribal Council out of Bristol Bay, Alaska. Fred, welcome on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. So have you always lived up in Alaska? Uh, no, I've, I've lived out of the state for a little while, but Alaska's in my blood. I always come home. Uh, I haven't left the state to live anywhere else since 97. So yeah, Alaska is just, it's so beautiful. I, I hate it this time of year because it's so miserable. It's dark and cold all the time, but it's beautiful. It's, I can't even put it into words, you know. I've always wanted to go to Alaska. I'm sure a lot of people say that. I'm obsessed with any of the Alaska shows. I'm sure that you might have some thoughts about some of those shows. But uh, and, and actually, now that I have you on, I don't talk to a whole lot of people out of Alaska. So what do you, what do you think about shows that are based out of Alaska? Do you watch any of those? Have you caught any of those shows? I I've tried. But, you know, like the Alaska Killer Bigfoot, I, I tried to watch an episode and they show an elder. They must have paid him good money. But, you know, elders don't come down to the shoreline as you're about to leave somewhere to tell you you're stupid. They, they, they'll they call you over for dinner and tell you in private. They don't they don't do that kind of crap. And obviously there's a lot of shenanigans when it comes to Hollywood. Uh, you know, they have their. Oh, their agenda for production and not necessarily 
uh, truth. Uh, I, they put just enough truth in there to keep it tantalizing, and then they over dramatize everything. You know, every step it doesn't deserve dramatization. You know. Yeah, and it's funny that you mentioned those shows. I wasn't even. I know those shows are uh, those shows. I can't even really stand to watch. To be honest with you, it's the ones that are more they're you know reality based, uh, like uh, Light Below Zero or Alaska: The Last Frontier, that are not based around cryptids coming and quote unquote. There's right. my air quotes. And, cryptids and coming those, in and begging on the cabins. Right, and those ones I've I've tried to stomach those, but I, I live that life so it's easy to pick out the scripted crap, mm, you know, when, yeah. when someone has to build a sled cause all the other ones weren't, they're just outdated. Come on. That that's not new news. That's yeah, yeah. not <laughs> newsworthy. That's not, that's not an episode worthy. That's just, it's just garbage. They, they try to make everything so extreme and you don't need that. Life is hard enough up here without over dramatizing it. And, I mean, putting it in the realm of how, how can we do it? Well, there's almost a million of us. There's about 780,000 people in the state, you know, and most of them are in the population centers of like Juneau, Anchorage, the, the Kenai Peninsula and Fairbanks. But it's hard to put into words unless you've lived here because it's hard to go from like it could get up to 20 degrees above today. And literally, when I get up tomorrow morning, it could be 30 below and it could stay 30 below for a week or two. You know what I mean? Or yeah. more. And it, until you live it, it's hard to you can't capture that on camera. You can show a thermometer all you want. But if no one has the reference point of what 30 below is, they, they won't understand. So it's kind of hyperbole, you know. That's why I think I'm fascinated by those shows. It's the. The star of the show is the elements themselves and trying to imagine what that would be like on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that's why uh, so many people are fascinated. Uh, and, and plus just, quote-unquote, the simple life. Well, it's not so simple. I mean, as you say, there's there's a lot of things, and we were talking before we really got started, that can kill you and that you have to respect. And uh, that's the basis of what we're here to talk about today, though, is, of course, uh, cryptids. Bigfoot and little people specifically. And I wanted to say so that people can go while we're chatting, go to his website, subarcticalaskasasquatch.com, because not only have you curated stories from Alaska or encounters, I should say, but there's also an insane interactive map on there. And I love that you did that. And bravo to you and whoever you had work on that with you. Not every website has that. It's tough to make that happen. So, uh, I mean, where did right. you, where did all of this come from then, Fred? Like your interest in cryptids, when did that start for you? And was that specific to, you know, once you actually were in Alaska and you, you now, I, I do happen to know, of course, with you being part of your Cure Young tribe. I want to talk about that. And again, before we started, we mentioned it a little bit, but let's touch back on, let's start there. Let's start with the beliefs of your tribe and what they would tell you about Sasquatch and the respect needed between you and the Sasquatch and what, what the beliefs there were. Right. And, you know, uh, there's still a lot of superstition involved. Um, there, there's a strong belief that even speaking about the hairy man uh, can bring them into you, uh, cause trouble, bring a bad omen. And so I'm kind of going against the grain and, and what I was taught when I was young. And that's, you know, that they're not our friend. Uh, we were never taught that uh, in any way, shape or form are we to interact with them. We were always told that they will steal you. They'll steal your women and children. They'll eat you. There, there was never anything good that was told to us about the hairy man. It has always been an ominous sign. You know, one to stay away from. Don't follow tracks. You know, don't follow the strange whistles in the woods. You know, be somewhere safe by the time it gets dark out in the woods. And just, you know, just those safety factors. Because, it, well... And the same thing goes for little people. There's things said every tribe is a bit different depending on their experiences with these, you know, these creatures. In some places, they're more ominous. In other places, they're more tricksters. You know, it, it just depends on what area and what kind of contact that the, the people from that area have had. Like there's tribes down in Canada that 
just think of them as whistlers in the woods and, you know, nothing more than that. It, it, and then it goes on up from there to, you know, those missing people. It, it, it varies, but it, the overall from all the natives I've spoken to from different areas have the same overall umbrella guideline of you don't follow them. You can't trust them. They'll eat you. And, and it, it's prevalent all throughout the state. What does that mean as far as your thoughts on researchers then, and this could be in, in, in uh, you know, the lowers or anywhere that they're trying to get in touch with a Bigfoot. They go out, they whistle, they whoop. What are your thoughts on that? Because they are trying to not only draw attention to themselves, but they are trying to encourage those interactions. Right. And you got to be careful what you wish for. and just by going out there it doesn't that doesn't mean anything um the the encounters are so random in nature and they seem to come when people are in a vulnerable position for the most part so if you go out there ready for them and this and that i highly doubt you you know anything's going to happen you may hear something way off in the distance but you're, you're not going to get a, a Jane Goodall moment where, you know, you're touching fingers in the woods and, you know, that kind of crap. I, I just don't see that happening. Although, you know, there, there are those that go out and find excellent evidence. I don't begrudge them for that. But to attempt to try to make contact and, and film it, I I don't know. I, I've seen channels that, that claim that, and I, I don't know. I'm not there. I don't want to cast dispersions on anyone. But I haven't seen that. I have not. Now, I've heard of, you know, uh, stories from like the 1860s out of Ninana where a lady got stuck at fish camp down off the Copper River, which is a long way from Ninana. But uh, she got caught and had to winter there at the fishing cabin, and it was really cold out. She was out gathering firewood and noticed a young hairy man off in the trees and ran back inside scared or whatever. And she had she had no choice but to collect firewood and when she would go out to collect it this hairy man started helping her and she you know found these other pieces of firewood that the hairy man had collected so she let it in when spring came she brought the hairy man with her back to nanana and from what was said from a, a tribal elder up there in nanana that 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 hairy man stayed with her until she died and then went back off into the trees so I have heard of coexistence uh, to what level that is. I, I don't know, but it is coexistence. So I, I can't, I, I haven't seen it, but I can't say it's all bad. You, you know what I mean? Uh, it's just from my own personal experience. I'll tell you right now, I'm biased. I don't trust them. Only thing I got for them is heavy caliber, high velocity. That's all I got because I've seen the flip side of the coin when they come in aggressively. So I don't, they used up all their cool points, you know, they, there's no going back for me as far as that's concerned. I, I, I have no trust whatsoever in these creatures. So you're talking about one of your own personal experiences where they broke your trust and now you're, you're, you're oh, like, I'm out. Yeah, no, no, they, yeah, yeah, no, they, they, they were trying to get us. There's no if, ands or buts about it, but you know, I, I've, I've shared that in, in many places or whatever, and it, it's, it, it takes a while to, to explain and share but yeah i you know up until 2006 i would have told you ah they make noise you leave you're good that you know they may throw rocks or whatever to get you out of there but you're good but then i saw the other side of the coin and it, it's real ugly it, I, I wouldn't wish that on anybody and that's why you know i i meet a lot of people and hear from a lot of people that would love to have an encounter and I mean, you know, when they hear the fanciful stories of forest friends, it, it kind of, and you know, Harry and Henderson's type of thing, I, I, you know, I feel they're setting themselves up for uh, a lot of danger. You know, these are territorial beings that just don't give a crap about you. And I appreciate you saying that, Fred. You kind of like, listen, I've, I've told this story on a, a plenty of other shows. So I agree. People can go find that probably pretty easily. But I did want to ask you just really quickly. In regards to that experience, then, it sounds like, as you say, 2006 was kind of a turning point. Was there an expenditure of ammo during that situation? 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It was, it was a night of, of terror. I, I, I mean, it, it was, it was shocking to the system. You know, I, I didn't realize what food felt like until that night. And I had always had intuition in the woods, you know, but it, it seemed like that experience unlocked that primal fear. And I, uh, I have a better sense in the woods. Like you, you can feel energy and, you know, when you're out in the woods and stuff. And if I feel, if I get a gut feeling about a certain place, if I'm out in the woods or a trail, I, and if I get that feeling, I don't care if I'm well armed or whatever, I, I won't go down that trail. You know, I, I just won't. Because, like I said, I, I know the flip side of that coin and I want nothing to do with it because I shot one of these things with a 30 out six 50 yards away. It did nothing. Uh, it stopped moving forward, but it didn't buckle or anything. And we used that identical rifle, same one, to kill walrus, you know, 2,000 pound walrus within a shot or two. And this thing didn't even flinch. So then what does that mean for you? And what are the beliefs then of most of the tribes out there that these things are not 100% flesh and blood? Um, it, it depends on which tribe you talk to. Uh, they've always been flesh and blood to me. Uh, I didn't see them coming out of portals. Uh, I didn't see them dancing around a Ouija board or nothing that night. But there's definitely flesh and, and blood component. And, and you talk to other people. There may be more of a spiritual component, which, again, I, I haven't dealt with that side of it personally, but I can't discount it either just because I haven't seen it. I'm no expert. You know, I, I, I'm not the be all to end all, but I haven't seen it. That's not to say that it doesn't happen. And as far as other tribes, spiritual beliefs on it, I, I couldn't speak for them. I, I have no clue. What about people talking about they could be in a, in you know in their camp or on a campfire or just walking through the woods and they encounter essentially this area or bubble of complete total utter silence where everything is just it, it's it's like the whole area not only muted to nothing but it's like well I'll stop it there and then I can add something on that I've heard as well but have you ever encountered that yourself? Oh, yeah, several times. Um, I've actually recorded videos for my channel out in the woods where it was dead quiet, you know, and it's especially spooky when you're in an area where there's a, a 10 inch diameter spruce tree that had been twisted 180 degrees and pushed over, not broken, but forced over with a perfect bend and it, it broke tree roots, you know. Mm. Um, so it, and snow load doesn't do that. You know, so it, dealing with that, that sense of quiet, I, I've dealt with it many times before, and I'll leave the area. I, I made the video brief, and I went to a different area where it wasn't so dead quiet to continue filming because I, I just, I'm no hero. You know, I'm not Superman, and I sure as hell ain't going to put myself in a situation in hopes of getting some good footage. At, you know, there's... 500 to 2,000 people go missing up here every year and grant you some go missing by, you know, sheer will and wanting to disappear and others are murdered and so on. But that's an awfully large number. And the what gets me is the mysterious missing people like that without a trace, you know, just gone. You know, there was a hunter last year in August. He went missing, you know, outside of cold foot, a caribou hunter. Uh, just gone. You know, uh, a lot of people said that, you know, the troopers wouldn't allow tracking dogs and this and that. Well, they did. The dogs wouldn't track. So it, it regardless, you bring a tracking dog that won't track, you, you know, you, you're, you're getting nowhere with it. And there was another lady, uh, Mary Wilson, uh, last July 12th was the last time she was seen. And she was reported missing on the 14th. They found her truck at mile 6.9 on the Stampede Trail. And luckily, her grandson, who was in the back seat, a two-year-old, was just a little bit dehydrated, but, you know, no worse for the wear. But Mary is gone. You know, she knows the area. You know, she lived around the Healy area. And they found some personal belongings of hers a mile further up the trail. And she knows the area. She would know what direction to go for help. They said the truck looked like it got stuck off the side of the road. 
you know, uh, things of this nature. There, there's there's things that just don't add up when it comes to some of these missing pre, uh, missing person cases, and they have a cop out. Yeah, it's called an open investigation. So even if you go to look, all you can get is the missing person bulletin, last place seen, what they're wearing, and yada yada. But you can't get any further. You know, when I first started my channel, I tried to get 911 records for strange creature calls, you know, just just to kind of just get some information going. And, you know, the, the state claimed they don't keep up on the database because COVID was going on and this and that. And I'd have to file a Freedom of Information Act to get any information I had because uh, I'm not a tech guy. So I had tech guys dig into it. They got the same response. So I was like, OK. So I don't know if it's a concerted effort to keep those missing person cases the way they do, or if it's just how the system works it out to where, okay, open investigation, of course, you know, they want to hold their cars close to vest or whatever, but it, it gets frustrating. And so that was going to be a component of my channel, but I can't because I, I can't get the information to make it a part of the channel. So I just, opted out of that portion of it. So if you guys would get any of these FOIA requests back, I don't even know if that's a, if you did, but if you did, was a, a, so much of it redacted that it's basically worthless? I haven't even attempted. Yeah. Um, when I made an inquiry, I was, I was given a monetary value that uh, I would have to pay, which mm -hmm. I, I don't even want to get into that, but I, I just, I, I put the brakes on right there because life is short enough without trying to jump rope bureaucratic crap. You know what I mean? Right. So I'd rather put my efforts into talking to people and getting information out there. Well, and you've already brought it up, but it, you know, it's pulled something I noted um, yesterday when I was looking into this stuff with you and it's from your website, as you say, 500 to 2000 people a year. And then you go on to say, if even one of those people taken by Sasquatch is just one too many. So is your thought then that occasionally this does happen, that Sasquatch oh, is Oh, 100%. The hey, yeah. Had we, okay. What happened in 2006 is we were lured out after it got dark. Now, this is all 2020 hindsight because in the moment we thought it was a bear leaning against the place because we were on a salmon river on the Nuyakuk River. But we were lured out. There was there was five total that night and they were doing anything and everything to get us out of the structure. And, you know, it seems kind of weird, but it's almost like they have a set of rules they have to go by. Because if a door shut, typically they won't try to come in. There's been a few cases, but for the most part, they stay outside of the cabin or structure or whatever. Anyway, but back to what you're saying. Yes, I, I strongly believe that people go missing due to these creatures. I strongly believe that. I mean, it, historically speaking, my tribe speaks of it. Several other tribes speak about it. There's uh, the Atna tribe on the Copper River Valley. You know, they're one of their elders their oral history states that horse creek which is right off of the copper river not too far um from copper center between copper center and chitna on the opposite bank it, they dictate that the hairy man over there years past villagers have found these creatures with human bones at their feet and so yeah i definitely believe it's still ongoing and it's it's really hard to prove because we don't have that missing person side of it. You know what I mean? We'll, we'll never get their side of the story. So yeah, it's real creepy stuff, you know, and that's, you know, you brought up the, the interactive map that's for people. That's like public safety. I encourage them to check out the map. If they're going to an area, it's embedded with my YouTube channel. So if you click on a marker in an area, you're going, let's say up by Denali, you click on a marker, it'll bring up, an encounter story, the year, the time of year, and what happened with those people. So it's just a database basically for people who want to know and look for potential signs like a 800 pound owl doesn't exist. So if you hear owl hoots, you know, by Delta Clearwater, chances are it's not an owl, you know, and beware and get out of there, you know, just, just like being bear aware, you know. 
During that 2006 encounter, at what point did you all realize that you were not dealing with a bear or bears? Oh, as soon as we stepped out the door and panned our light over to the left, we saw three sets of eye shine and it was like bright red fence post markers. And typically in the past, when we would beam one of these things with the light, they would try to duck behind a tree or, you know, obscure their face or whatever from the light. And these three didn't care. And we stepped right back inside. Within a moment, I'm eyes to eyes with one less than three feet away at an 18 by 24 inch window looking at me. I know what a bear looks like. I'm well versed in bears. I'm from the land of big bears and it wasn't a bear. Uh, it looked Native American around the eyes, uh, like those old tin types, real wrinkle. I mean, fine wrinkles. The eyes were like black translucent marbles. The skin color was an ash and gray. And the nose was real flat to the face, real broad at the nostrils. And in that 18 inch window, it was 18 inches tall, 24 inches wide. In that, in that space, I saw from the bottom of its nose to the top of its eyebrows. I mean, why do you why do you guys think that they were so pissed that you were there? I mean, there's a lot of room to stretch out in Alaska. Why why were they so adamant that you guys get the hell out of there? Well, unbeknownst to me, um, that area has a long history of those kind of encounters. I've shared a few of them on my channel. We were in an old fishing game counting tower that had like at least a decade before gone to lidar or radar. You know where they roll out the the mat across the bottom of the the river to count the fish versus someone climbing a tower and literally counting them one by one but we were in one of those places when this happened and it just so happens that area is real close to the proposed pebble mine which is the largest gold deposit they claim in the world and i think there might be something that that goes along with that you know there's a there's a history of gold miners prospectors dealing with these creatures i don't know if it's uh you know some kind of geo energy you know because there's a large amount of copper in the area gold quartz you know where energy flows through so I, i'm not sure you know there's variables to it but i believe it it it's always been that way up there and i have no smoking gun so to speak to say why because Years later, after my experience in 06, I randomly asked one of my cousins, hey, it was right after I started my channel. I said, hey, you got any good hairy man stories? You know, and he goes, first thing he asked me is like, have you ever been on the Nuyakuk River? And I laughed and I was like, yeah, I've been there. And they had a very similar experience. But this this creature, uh, they were in a shed at the larger um, fishing game counting tower which is closer to Kaliganik by the mouth of the Nuyakuk where it meets up with the Nushigak River and this thing kicked the door in of the shed showed its teeth and then fled away a couple years later a couple from that same group were in the main cabin and they had left the outer door open and this thing came into the place and looked in and over the top of the inner door and there was three guys in there and one of the guys on the top bunk that was almost face to face with it took the safety off his rifle. This thing was backing out and tried to snatch one of the guys to drag him with and tore his jacket. Wow. So, yeah. And I mean, I can go on and on all day about that area. It's it's rife with activity. Just one one experience after the other. And I would say eight out of ten of those experiences involve people having to use firearms to keep them back. I mean, that poor frigging guy almost getting dragged out by the Sasquatch. I mean, ha once that actually happened, there would be no way to fight against something that large. And what are you guys supposed to do? You know, the guys that are left in the cabin would just right. be like, what the hell are we supposed to do? Yeah. I, I mean, there's a couple guys missing from uh, Nustuya Hawk. A couple kids is almost a decade ago now. They There was three of them, and... The two ended up going missing after prepping a cabin uh, for an elder for the trapping season. This was late in the fall before the snow flew. They were just getting the cabin ready, you know, putting the stove pipe in, making sure firewood was ready. You know, just standard stuff you do for an elder. And that night they were lured out. This this guy who this is what he told me 
they heard noise outside. They heard weird whistling. So they went out to investigate. He was the last one in the line of three. The first guy out, he couldn't, he was, his view was obstructed going out the door, but he was snatched up onto the roof. And the, uh, the guy right behind him chased after to look, you know, what happened to his friend. He got snatched out of view. And when the guy that told me this experience came out the door, he was trying to look around because it was just getting dark. He saw the first guy that got snatched getting basically eaten on. They had him, his chest tore open. There's two of them scooping blood out of his chest and uh, eating his liver or something along those lines. And the second guy that got snatched was basically crushed like a beer can, forcing his innards out onto the ground as the guy that told me this ran off. When I first heard that story through someone else, I was like, man, this is bullshit, you know? Uh, Cause it was when I first heard it, it was before my encounter, but I ended up meeting that guy a few years later and his right eye is, is like the night rider little, little light in the front, just back and forth. His left eye stays solid. He'll look at you, but his right eye has a twitch. I mean, a bad twitch, like brain damage kind of twitch. You know what I mean? From that experience, you know, he was, he tried to tell his story to the authorities when they showed up because the troopers up here in Alaska, they have to be dispatched in. They have to get flown into some of these places because there's not a constant law enforcement presence. There may be like a village public safety officer. But, you know, when bad things happen, the troopers have to get, you know, dispatched in or whatever. And that could take a couple of days due to weather. But by the time they arrived, he had already self-medicated with whiskey and was damn near incoherent so they just chalked up what he was saying to drunken delusion and just listed them as missing right they're like oh yeah sure a couple of your friends got popped like soda cans okay buddy yeah exactly they just shined it on and you know told him to quit talking that nonsense unless you know he could potentially face charges if they find any you know any kind of you know foul play or whatever they were best friends you know there was no foul play outside of what happened you know he he wasn't part of you know taking their lives or anything but just you know that kind of stuff i i sometimes i get twitchy in the woods you know um sometimes it's easier than others and there are times where i just i have a hard time just being out there especially when it gets real quiet you know sometimes i i go out on my four wheeler and to film you know, someone's encounter by myself or whatever. And it, it's hard sometimes, you know, just because I, if I get the EBGBs or that weird feeling, I just, I, I can't continue. I have to find another spot, you know, and, and recollect my thoughts because it's just, it, it's hard. It, it, once you've experienced the, the other side of that coin outside of just, you know, the looks of aggression where, you know, they're breaking stuff and throwing stuff typically when you leave encounter ends you know i mean like on my channel the vast majority are you know these things show themselves sometimes there's shots fired sometimes not and people leave and that's the end of it you know what i mean but my curiosity is from the standpoint of what triggers the other side of it what triggered them to come in onto us when we we when we got there at that little lodge that little shack we didn't pop off guns. We weren't drinking and whooping it up. We were basically moved stuff inside from the skiff and we're inside quiet. You know, we had a lantern on. We we weren't in any way disrespecting the land other than we were there to gold prospect. You know, I mean, we, we hadn't even gotten to that. We weren't even there 24 hours. I mean, with your cousin, and that's pretty fascinating that he was like, hey, how about that Nuryakuk area? You're like, yeah, how about it? Let me tell you, with you guys both having that same experience in that area, have you noticed in collating all of these experiences in Alaska that there are patterns in temperament in certain areas or maybe times of the year? Have you noticed any patterns out there? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, in the fall, seems to really be an uptick in the aggression. Copper River Valley, um, you know, I'm talking from north of Cordova all the way on up to Copper River. Also, Bristol Bay area, up to Nushigak, up to Nuyakuk, uh, Iliamna, Lake Clark area, on over to the Wood Tick Chick State Park, you know, which is my old stomping grounds in Bristol Bay. From Aleknagik north, you, you get into those lakes. A lot of aggressive behavior, especially in the fall. 
And sometimes in the early spring, I do get accounts in the winter time of some craziness happening. And I don't, you know, let's be honest for anyone to come across one of these beings at anywhere between nine to 12 foot tall in the woods, no, no matter what this creature does, it's going to come across aggressive. You know what I mean? No matter if it shakes a tree, that's a sign of aggression to whoever is looking at it, regardless yeah. of what this creature means by it. The paranoid, scared mind is going to look at that as, oh, my God, there's a tree shaking. It's, you know, it's mad. But we don't know for sure. I'm just saying, you know, we got to keep it in context of the reality of it. If they're making noise and showing themselves, they're either distracting you for the movement of others to get out of the area or making themselves known so you will leave the area. You see what I mean? So that that's what I've learned. And, yeah, there are areas, Copper River Valley, uh, south of the Denali Highway by Tri Lakes, um, south of Swede Lakes, south of the North Fork of the Golcana, the Golcana River area, that, that can be an aggressive area. Again, Bristol Bay. And there's a few places on the Yukon River and the Kuskokwim River, but the population is so sparse and spread out that – you won't hear about it. Uh, like it's hard to get people to share their experiences, especially from the native villages. There's so much superstition, you know, they don't want to talk about it because speaking it out loud could draw them in and bring a bad omen, you know, bad fishing season, bad hunting, you know, stuff like that. So it's really hard to get some of those encounters from deep in the bush. So does that mean some of your fellow council members or elders have been like, Fred, you know, what are you doing? You're really calling attention to yourself with, with the big hairy guys. Um, I, I caught a little bit of flack when I first started the channel. And then once I stated my intention of public safety, like I don't care what anyone believes, it, even if they just think they're fanciful stories, that's fine. Listen to what's being said in the story for your own safety. You know, there is no 800 pound squirrels or owls you know or you know wolves you know that type of thing it, it uh, i caught a little bit of grief um but for the most part my first very first video i did i recount something that happened to one of my elder cousins um elizabeth osterhaus and you know she had an experience with one of these things back in like 1967 or, or yeah 67 or 69 down on Unalaska, which is next to Dutch Harbor, uh, windswept island, no trees. This thing imitated a known baby from the village to lure her and another relative out of the house. Mm. That level of cunning to use a woman's natural instinct to want to help a baby, a baby they know the cry of, is just cunning on a level I can't even wrap my mind around. Just weaponizing uh the women's feelings you know i've i've had uh young ladies share with me that they felt like they were in a trance when they first saw this creature and they had a warm feeling like their grandpa was inviting them over and by happenstance bumped their knee on the four-wheeler they were riding snapped them out of it and they saw it for what it was which was you know a hideous creature that wasn't there to be friendly Good Lord, that's another level of creep. And to be able to, as you say, not just mimic a baby, but a specific baby or child. Oh, identical. Mimicked it Ugh. identically. Yeah. You know, and she has she has nothing to lie about. You know, none of these people do. It's not like, you know, in our culture, in the Native culture in general, it's really hard to get native peoples to share because a lot of times when we have historically you get mocked you get ridiculed oh yeah hairy man oh, oh, oh bob has a beard he's a hairy man is that the hairy man you know that kind of crap you know so uh, according to like you know one of my elders told me why why waste your breath on the gussocks you know that young lady you mentioned where she said she felt like she was in a trance until thankfully she bonked her knee woke out of it do you think that that's something akin to a side effect of, of infrasound possibly this trance, I, you know, you, you have a valid point. Yes. I think a lot of this stuff, I think the quietness that we're talking about a minute ago, these trances, you know, they're, they're doing all these experiments with frequencies 
that night in 2006, as soon as we came back inside after seeing the eye shine, it felt like we had earmuffs on. So when I, when I initially shot the shotgun inside, it was just thump, thump, thump. I don't know if you've ever been near a 12 gauge shotgun, but in an eight foot square, my ears should have been just, just humming ringing. But all I heard was a thump, thump, thump. It mm. was like a constant pressure in the air that night. So yes, I definitely think infrasound, I don't know how, but I think that's definitely part of it. Yeah. And to what level does that go? Right. I mean, you mentioned in the onset here that you've actually shot one of these things and it should have affected it a whole lot more. I, I just, I don't yeah, know. It's what a 30 to make odd six. That. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, uh, I've always used a 30 odd six up until that point. I, I've uh, I, not braggadocia. I was a subsistence hunter. I've, you know, I worked bear control as well. I've never had a 30 odd six not drop the animal I was shooting from walrus to bear to moose to caribou, whatever. I've never had that rifle cartridge fail. Not ever until that, until that morning on the New Year cuck. And you said you could tell that it, in fact, hit it to some extent, but it it's not like you saw any kind of a, a, a wound, a gaping wound, anything no, the, like that. The no, one, the one that came out of the trees that I assumed through the rock, it was pitch black. It was so pitch black, it was like it was absorbing light. Um, mm. It was giving nothing back. When we beamed it the night before, uh, it was like it was absorbing the light. It was so black. I had no eye shine. I had no visible head to shoot for so i shot center mass and i heard my rounds hit you know i've shot plenty of moose at that distance or closer i know what a bullet sounds like when it hits the flesh of an animal and i heard all three of my shots hit this thing and again not braggadocia but i i'm a good shot at 50 yards and nothing's getting away you know what i mean that uh experience in 2006 sounds like a big bag of nope fred to be honest with you that sounds horrifying i mean what and we before we officially started, we, you know, you kind of mentioned this is where I live. My house is in the woods. You know, there's only so many things I can do to mitigate risk and being able to go out. And as you say, go out and collect encounters, all these things. But after 2006, what did that change for you? Or, or did you force yourself to do exactly what you had been doing prior to that? I forced myself. It's in my blood. I, I live in the woods by default, you know, just being in Alaska. Yeah, you can go and you know, walk around the city sidewalks or whatever. But up here in Alaska, wildlife is everywhere. You know, they got big brown bears that go right through Anchorage. You know, uh, a lot of the bear fatalities happen in Eagle River, which is just north of Anchorage. It, there's there's no boundaries for the wildlife. I, I literally have to mitigate bull moose in my yard right now. There, there's literally a bull moose somewhere on my property that I have to be aware of because a moose will stomp you to death. They don't care. Uh, you can't reason with them. You can't give a warning shot. They don't care. Bears, you could probably give a warning shot for the most part and they'll flee. But there, there's certain, like speaking about bears, there's certain mannerisms you've come to learn over your years of experience out in the woods on whether it's a bluff charge or defend yourself. You know what I mean? And when it comes to moose, there, there's none of that. If their ears are back and their hackles are up, God bless the dead. You, you find a good hiding place, stay out of the, you know, don't get stomped. Because the moose fight brown bears. I don't fight brown bears. You know what I mean? So they, they, it, it's, it's a wild place. You know, there's little TikTok videos of moose in Anchorage. Uh, look them up sometime. You'd be amazed at how they don't care. They, they really don't. There's even footage out there of a poor guy coming out of Key Bank in downtown Anchorage, and he got stomped to death by a female moose because kids were throwing snowballs at it, you know, a little time before that. Mm, God. There's no boundaries is what I'm getting at. You step yeah. outside, you're part of the food chain and not necessarily at the top of it. Have you come across any encounters where someone saw a, a Sasquatch, a actively hunting something or taking something down for food purposes? Uh, yeah, from caribou to moose to bear. Yes, I, I've, I've, I've heard a gambit from elders, a couple old fishermen back when they used to use small sailboats to catch salmon, which is good God. I did it with a powerboat and a net, and it was hard enough, but God bless those guys, man. 
they watched, uh, they were at Bear Bay at Aleknagik. They watched a bear come running out of the trees. They were waiting to set a net and they were waiting till more daylight. And this was first thing in the morning because they got there kind of late the day before and they weren't going to mess with the nets. But in the morning when they were getting their gear ready, this bear comes barreling out of the trees running and had a hairy man behind it chasing it. And it ran and it got to Bear Creek which is at the head of the bay. And as soon as it got to the creek, another one jumped out from the other side of the creek and snatched the bear up. The other one caught up and they just tore it apart and were scooping the blood out and, and eating it, ate the liver, the kidneys. And then uh, I forget what else, but just ate the most nutrient rich part of it and left it there torn apart. Now, considering what you had happened in Nuryakuk and also your cousin, does that mean that you completely avoid that area for any reason? Uh, no, uh, it, it's it, my eyes are open to the areas like that. Um, so I, I move differently because up until then, I, you know, they make noise. You leave your good. You know, I never saw that side of it. You know, and then once I did, I had a whole different kind of it was like a gut check on all the times I had seen these creatures in the past. What was actually happening, you know, in 2020 hindsight and all that can really drive you nuts when you sit there and try to, you know, understand the who's and the why's and the what ifs. You know, you don't want to play that game because it, it'll just drive you nuts. But it really opened my eyes, you know, to the. uh because like I said, up until then, I would have been like, ah, they make noise. Don't worry about it. Just leave. You know, don't follow them, but don't, you don't stay there. Just leave. Yeah. Until the, the, you're inside of a cabin and they're kicking your door down and you're going, I, hey, I was being as respectful as possible. Like you said, you, you know, you show up and you're not even trying to do anything. And even the other guys were like, we were, we were just here hanging out and they come and actually kicking doors down. Yeah. That's, that is and, totally and, opposite of the normal yeah. stories that you hear. Right. And I think for that, that particular area, um, I, I think it's, it's territorial more than anything because territorial makes more sense to me because from like King Salmon Creek down to Harris Creek to the Nuyakuk river, uh, I mean, on down, it, it's a resource, uh, resource rich environment with salmon, caribou, moose and all that. Right. But the season's so short. And I think because of our extreme, the extreme environment, this extreme weather conditions, the extremely short season for collecting those resources. I think that adds another level to that aggression to where, okay, l let's play devil's advocate and say they weren't trying to hunt us to eat us. But even if they weren't, they were aggressively trying to end us. And maybe they viewed us as a threat to their resources. Uh, you know, there, there's variables to it. So it's it's I felt like food when it looked at me in the window. I felt like food. I, I felt like a rabbit wood in a hole with wolves around that hole. It makes you wonder also if that Nuryukuk area would be a place that they go settle in to birth or raise young ones. And then you were just there at a wrong, a bad time of year for that. And they were pissed off about it. And they thought, well, since we're here, you know, like you said, they looked at you like food. I mean, it very well could be, you know, and that's that's another thing that drives me forward is, to, I mean, I, I don't know if I'll ever get any real answers to some of these things, but getting the experiences out there that people have gives us more data to work with. You know, I, I I'm, I'm a firm believer that we're at a tipping point here soon to where something's going to break loose regardless of where it comes from, what it stems from, whether someone drags in a body or two or whatever. But the, the problem I see is all the muddied water. You know, uh, there's there's places out there that uh, showcase, in my opinion, just sheer nonsense. I, I, I won't name names or anything, but there are places out there on the Internet where you, everyone knows the places that have made up stories. And they sound great. They're good for horror film, you know, or horror genre kind of you know, people who like to listen to a good scary story. Then there's other places that showcase supposed real life events that are, uh, in my opinion, hard to believe. And I've seen some crazy stuff. You know what I mean? So 
take what you know take what you will from it but th there's stuff out there that i feel is really muddying the waters and is a detriment to those who are really trying to find real answers and do real research and i think because of those muddied waters uh society as a whole it's easier for them to dismiss the real deal and chalk it up to oh well look at this i saw this over here and that was obviously bullshit you know so ah, it, it makes it hard you know it, it makes it hard but i think we're at a tipping point and you know there'll be a lot of vindication coming soon in my opinion do you think it would be good for whatever reason for the bigfoot or for anybody living out in the bush for them to actually come to light and the whole world now knows that we're not full of shit and we're not crazy for talking about this I think it'll be a double-edged sword, you know, because no matter what, the, there's going to be naysayers. And sometimes the voices of the naysayers are louder than those that are screaming the truth. You know what I mean? So uh, I think it'll be an uphill slope, but I, I definitely think uh, it, it would eventually work out to that. Yeah, like, you know, told you so, you know, because that, that told you so moment, I feel, is coming. Um, with all the technology we have nowadays, I, I think it's inevitable uh, because uh, what I've seen through my own eyes, when I see a video online of someone's capture of footage, you know, for me, it's real easy to pick out the hoax versus the real deal. There, there's certain, it's a body type, it's a, it's a movement, it's, it's what they are, it's how they move, no different than seeing a bear you know, over the years move and, you know, how they react and, and, and do certain stuff. So, you know, and for those who don't know, it, it's easy to just chalk it up to all garbage, you know, it's just all junk, you know, and, and that's unfortunate, you know, cause I've showcased experiences from law enforcement, current law enforcement at high levels, federal investigators, doctors, nurses, you know, people that are trusted first responders, first reporters, all that kind of stuff. And they remain anonymous because they're smart enough to know that, hey, no one's going to believe me and it's going to risk my job. And there's a lot of that going on. And I think if there wasn't so much ridicule, and I'm sure with what you dealt with, you you know exactly what I'm talking about. High level law enforcement, retired sheriffs, retired cops, all that. I'm hoping in the near future that there's a large amount of vindication to where it'll allow those who are suffering in silence. You know, a lot of people have PTSD from their experience, good, bad, or indifferent. And I feel once it reaches a certain point, a lot more people will come forward with what they've seen, what they've dealt with, or what they've heard from, you know, a trusted individual in their family or whatever. Cause right now, uh, you know, I, I feel a lot more of the fanciful garbage is getting pushed forward versus the the real deal, you know, uh, type stuff. And I, I think that's just hurting everybody, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. And that's, that is uh, certainly the case. And on, on top of that, as you say, with your tribal members and the elders, you guys are in, you're encouraged to zip it up. I mean, that, and that may not ever change, even if these, uh, probably especially if these things come to light, because then it's, you're going, oh my God, now everyone's going to be talking about this. That's really not good. Yeah, you know, that, that old superstition, and it started somewhere, and it's probably based in some form of reality. You know, they didn't say don't talk about it for no reason, because I'm sure it started somewhere to say, oh, if you talk about it, they'll come in. I'm, I'm sure right. something like that has happened, you know. Um, I interviewed uh, Hillary. She's from the same village I am, uh, but from a different family. And we knew of each other over the years, but we never spoke about Harry Man or anything like that. And I, uh, it's Voices from the Village number two. And I asked her, what was she taught? And it was along the same lines, you know, that they're, they're dangerous. They'll kill you. They'll eat you. They'll steal you. You know, so I, I only did that to showcase that when I say we were raised, I wasn't just talking about my immediate family. I was talking about, you know, it takes a village and, you know, we were all maybe, maybe not all. Cause some people just won't 
acknowledge it whatsoever. They won't allow their kids to talk about it because of that old superstition. But I know of people in my own family that have spoken to their own brothers, sisters, and whatever, and still won't acknowledge it. You know what I mean? So it, it's there. there's a dynamic to it that makes it kind of hard to navigate at times. How many have you seen? Me personally? Mm-hmm. Gosh. Um, up close within uh, 300 yards, I would say seven or eight. Um, at a distance, uh, 16, 17. We've talked quite a bit about them being aggressive, you've had your own aggressive experiences, and you have said there have been more positive things peppered in that you've you've had stories come into you. Of out out of your encounters, do you have any more, you know, quote unquote positive, whatever that means, I don't know, but have you had experiences maybe even after the 2006 experience where you're like, okay, well, we definitely ran into some a holes, but there's some more, uh, there's some better temperamented ones out there. Uh, not me personally. No, I, I've spoken to people who have had, uh, not so aggressive encounters, uh, more inquisitive, more curious. And, and I showcase them. I, I don't, I don't gatekeep that kind of stuff just because of my own personal bias. I, I make that clear. I, I, I personally don't trust them, but that's, that's on me, not anyone else. Uh, but no, not me personally. No, I, I, I don't have anything uh, as far as I could say for me personally, that's positive. This is going to be maybe a stupid question, maybe a tough question, but, and if you don't, if you've never thought about this, just ignore me. We'll go on. But out of all the encounters that you've, you've collated, what do you think the, you know, what's the weight on percentage as far as what we would generally term an aggressive encounter versus something more benign? What's, what's the ratio there from the encounters that you've collected? For the overwhelming majority, it, it comes across to me like uh, a show of force to get you out of the area. And, and that is above and, and beyond the overwhelming through line. However, what drives me forward is those instances of outright aggression, which I, I would say uh, 98.9% is that display of force and not, uh, and again, aggression is perceived you know from the eyes of the beholder i mean let's be honest uh, something that large shaking a tree at 30 yards you're going to take that as 100 percent aggression regardless it's going to startle you it's going to scare the shit out of you and it's going to come across like aggression when in reality it may just be getting your attention to get you out of there right, right? but I, I would say 98.9 percent is that versus the other you know 1.1% of or 2.1% of just sheer aggression, outright attack. Seeing that one with the Native American type eyes outside the window staring at you, is is that the closest that you've been to one? Yeah, that was three feet at the most away from me. Oh, no thanks. Yeah, um, it, it looked right at me and it, everything inside me was like, defend yourself, defend yourself. You know, it started moving out of the view of the window and I shot through the wall with the 12 gauge three times, boom, boom, boom. And again, it was, it was so much pressure uh, that it was deafening silence. Yeah. I just don't know what to make of that aspect of that. Right. And we've heard that. I've heard that so many times where it's just this cone of silence area and you're going, well, how, why, what, you know, I, I don't even know what to make of that. Yeah. Especially like up here in the summertime, you're always hearing songbirds, chickadees, you know, whatever it may be, you know, sterling jays or whatever there's magpies always, there's always some kind of critter making noise, squirrels chirping. And you can go to an area and you hear all the sounds of the forest. It's fine. You go back to that same area and all of a sudden it's like a dead zone. You know, it, it's, it's so eerily quiet. Like anytime I'm in a place like that and I'm filming, it shows on camera. Cause I am nervous as a hen, man. I tell you, I'm, I'm constantly moving the camera around. I'm looking in different places. It, it's really hard to focus when that kind of environment's going on around you. What month was that in 2006 when you guys had that happen? Uh, September 17th. 
So you've been filming for your YouTube channel and kind of had that the woods go quiet and you're kind of like, oh, oh shit, it's going, something's happening right now. Yeah. And I'll, I'll go to a different area, you know, cause a lot of times, unless I'm on like an excursion with my buddy, I call him squatch bait and he hates that shit. <laughs> but, uh, it, by default, anyone that goes with me, I consider them bait. You know what I mean? Heck yeah. I, I always, I always have the mindset of I'll make it out, but you know, it's good <laughs> yeah. to have good bait. You just got to run faster but, than uh, he does. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's other ways, but yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you're like, there's darker ways, but, but we don't need to bring those. <laughs> yeah, we won't speak on that. Yeah. You know, uh, but yeah, I definitely relocate. You know, I, I don't even like being on camera. I, I strictly, I, I mean, I absolutely hate it, but I, I do it because no one else is doing it. And not that I'm some hero or uh, I'm looking for accolades. I'm not. I, I'm just like the news anchor. Hey, you know, this happened to Joe Schmo over here. Be aware this happened you gotta check you later you know i never i never say oh you gotta believe this person or you gotta believe that i don't care what anyone believes i i could give a flying rat's butt it doesn't matter to me i i know the real deal i know what's going on out there and i don't need someone to believe it yeah just hear it whether you just want to take it as a story that's fine whatever just keep that stuff in mind from that encounter you heard and it may help you out in the future, you know? Yeah, and again, I, I encourage everybody to go to the website, subarcticalaskasasquatch.com, and check out the encounters and the interactive map. Well, Fred, let's switch gears for the closing segment here and talk a little bit about the little people encounters in Alaska. Can we start off with what is a little person and what are some of the common attributes of little people in Alaska that you've seen reported? Um, well, further up north, you know, along the Arctic coast and whatnot, they're more, what's been reported, they look like little native children, real round faces, foot and a half, two foot tall, wearing seal skin to the medium sized ones, which are more inland or whatever, that are more goblin kind of looking, kind of like a greenish gray skin, um, more leather type of uh, dress to the ones that are roughly three foot tall that have, you know, big hook noses, real long arms, real long claws. They can shape shift. Um, it's said that they dance underneath the Northern lights. And if you hear them whistling and they're dancing under the Northern lights, don't get close. They could steal your soul. You know, one of the experiences that stand out as far as little people experiences, and it's, uh, it's titled little people in the fog. Uh, something along those lines, uh, a native uh, named Vincent, he he shared what him and some fellow villagers experienced with this fog that rolled into their village. And it was during the day, but inside the fog, it seemed like time slowed down. His, his mom and his aunt were on a snow machine and their snow machine wasn't moving as fast as it could, you know, and, and they recognized it immediately that something was off. And they saw this figure, everyone that saw this figure in the fog saw someone they knew, but it wasn't the person they knew. Uh, this particular guy, he when he went into the fog, he thought his friend was calling him for help, but he got closer and he saw the real, the real deal, which was one of these beings that were about three foot tall, real long arms, sharp nails, uh, that, that kind of description. On the other side of the fog, at the same time, his friend that he thought he saw was actually outside of the fog and thought he saw Vincent in the fog asking for help. So it was almost a simultaneous, they were being drawn in by this creature. Uh, real creepy stuff, you know, and understand get, just getting them to share that was very, very hard because, again, a lot of these things are in a closed environment. A lot of people don't like to speak about it outside of the village or even within the family. Uh, there was another guy who, uh, it was last year, uh, knew the guy since I was knee high. Uh, I have yearbooks from 1984 and 85 from Dillingham and he's in them. And he called me out of the blue one day and he's current law enforcement. We'll, we'll leave it at that. But 
he, you know, he asked at first if I remembered him and I laughed. I was like, of course, we're, <laughs> and we're, we're from Dillingham. Of course I remember you, you know? And he goes, well, what do you know about little people? And I told him the little bit I knew that if you're being harassed, you, you leave out a little bit of tobacco and some dried meat and they should leave you alone. That That's what I've heard. I've never dealt with them personally, but I pass that along and he goes, okay, well, I was woken up to banging on my walls. He said, it started off banging. I thought it was my neighbor who's a drunk and I thought he was coming over to beg for some liquor and I yelled, go home. I have no booze. And it continued around his house. And by the time it got up to his front door, he was already up with his shotgun yelling, I'm a state trooper, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Warning whoever it was to back off. And he opens the door and right out on his gravel pad is this little person standing there looking at him. And he's yelling at him, hey, you're trespassing, you know, I'll arrest you. And he was trying, it, it was land of the midnight sun. It's kind of hard unless you've dealt with it yourself. Imagine twilight with just enough light to see, but all the trees are dark and silhouetted, right? So it, it's similar to that as far as the lighting. And he can make out this hook-like nose, what you would picture on an old witch, um, real grayish green, like a gosh, like a lichen green, but darker in shade. And he said it had real long arms. And once he realized what he was looking at, because he was just woken up to this pounding, he pointed the shotgun in the air. And when he did that, when he pointed up and said, you'll get shot, you're trespassing, this thing immediately multiplied into five of them. And they were all moving around. And it freaked him out, right? Because he he's, you know... Johnny Law, so to speak. So this it really threw him off. And so he shoots into the air and they all disappear. Boom, just gone. But he heard walking on a gravel pad, this thing walk off into the trees and saw the shrubs move as it wandered off. And does he live out in the woods in a really rural area? Yeah, he lives in Bristol Bay mm. in a village. And he had, and prior to this, it, it he had never had an experience with, with these guys before. Nope. So what's with nothing. I wonder what the guess is on, you know, why did, why did they zero in on him at that time? What was going on? You know, I don't know, but you know, that, that's another intriguing thing is it's so random in nature. You know, I've talked to hunters that have gone to the same area, 40 plus years, same campsite, never a problem until one day, one random 20 minute encounter with the hairy man and, and they won't go back that, you know, they've given up hunting altogether. You know, it, it's it's so random in nature, it, and that that's another thing that intrigues me and, and drives me forward. What's the catalyst? What's what's the draw? You know what I mean? Because in a lot of occurrences, it seems like vulnerability draws certain encounters, mm. and that's kind of creepy in and of itself. You know, thinking about them imitating babies and such like that to to prey on vulnerability of women. It, it kind of makes you wonder, you know, wh what's that driving force? Well, and certain elements, and I'm not trying to lump them to, together or, or anything, uh, but, you know, the, the predatory or even maybe that you could call it the trickster element of both Sasquatch and the little people. I mean, with the guy who said, you know, uh, the fog and he's got what he thought was his friend calling for help is exactly like what you just mentioned again with this specific baby crying in the woods. And it was a Bigfoot mimicking to try to get the lady out there. So it, it's the exact same scenario and it's extremely predatory. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, who's, who's to say what would have happened? Cause again, we don't hear that side of the story. The people right. who go missing because of these situations, we'll never hear that side of it. You know, are the little people ever spotted in the even slightly more urban areas of Alaska? Um, not that I've heard. Uh, most of the uh, little people sightings I have I hear are from like the Bristol Bay, Yukon, Kuskokwim Delta area up onto the Arctic coast. A couple out of Eagle, you know, uh, the majority of them come from coastal areas and not by high, uh, highly populated areas. Can you share one or two of your favorite little people encounters? Uh, one of them was that one in the fog. Uh, there's another one where a young lady in Dillingham saw one, and it was it was taking a crap, 
and she couldn't believe what she was seeing. Uh, the singer was dressed in caribou hide, uh, said it, it had more um, white man skin, a beard, almost like you would envision an elf, but it had really long arms and it, it was stealing stuff. It was, it was stealing anyone's tobacco left out. It was stealing small trinkets you know, things of that nature. So th those are the, uh, the other ones I, I don't, I, I have a bunch of them that I have to get back hold of the people to talk to them about. That's another thing I'm doing with the channel is I'm going to go through all the cryptids in Alaska. I just so happen to start on the Alaskan Harry Man project because it, it's a little closer to home, so to speak. But I have Kushtaka encounters, Moose Man, the little people, and, and hell wolves uh all the way to you know ufo type encounters so there there's a whole lot to unpack honestly last question about the little people out of the the three different ones that you've described is the is the word around the campfire that the shape shifter hook nose ones are the ones that you need to avoid the most or that you don't want to run into the most Yes, yes, that's the overwhelming consensus because uh, it, it's like on January 17th, you're not supposed to have a mirror. You, you got to cover your mirrors. You're not, you shouldn't take a steam bath because it said the veil is thinnest between our world and theirs at that time. And so you're more susceptible to having your soul stolen or you being stolen and eaten. And that's on January 17th? Yes. I mean, do you follow those rules? Do you cover your mirrors on that day? I, I do not, but back home when my grandma was still alive, you better believe it, it was it was covered up, and I I I wasn't paying attention to that stuff, you know. I right. when I was younger, unfortunately, I kind of turned my back on my culture and was more worried about the bright lights in the big city because I I was raised in the village. I wanted to see other stuff, right? So that's one thing I could count on. And, and one January seventeenth, it was in um, 1991. I was still in high school but I was going to go start up the steam bath and I was told no. And I was like, well, why not? And I was told was well, January 17th, you know, you're not supposed to take a steam bath. And I was like, why? And they said, little people, no one batted an eye. And so I, I left it alone and I had to re-educate myself on that since. So in essence, this channel is helping me reclaim my culture. You know, I, I, I turned my back on it years ago and I regret that because I've lost so much just from elders passing and not retaining what was being said sometimes, just being a hard-headed kid, you know, I'm like, don't tell me this garbage, I know better, you know, that kind of attitude, which I'm paying for now. And so, you know, anyone out there turning their back on their culture, I I'd say don't do it, you know, embrace it. I mean, every day that you go out, I'm assuming that you're going, well, is this another day I'm going to run into another pissed off Sasquatch? I, I don't view it that way. I don't think they're hiding behind every tree. I, I get open invitations from people who have ongoing encounters on their property. And I would love to go and make that happen. But it is extremely hard logistically because Alaska is very large. You could fit 19 other states into this state, you know, and not just all the little ones either. And so uh, something nearby to me is not nearby let's say for you in perspective, you right. know, you got stores just right down the street, whereas here, you know, you got to go multiple miles to get to a store. So it, it's all in perspective, but we're spread out, you know, and to make it to some of these places, it's three, 400 miles one way, you know, not counting the, the time there and the time back. So it, it's more a logistical thing. I would really like to get out and, and do more as far as like on-site research. I've done it a few times when I can afford it, but it's it's hard to keep up with, you know, just by the vast distances. You know, some of the reports I get are from small villages that there ain't no way there but a plane. You know what I mean? And so it, it makes it almost impossible to go and, and research those areas. When Alaska is steeped in darkness, have you come across any uptick in Bigfoot encounters during that time? Uh, at remote lodges by people who are caretakers on the off season. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and trappers, you know, people going out into these remote cabins doing trapping, you know, there, there seems to be an uptick in 
Uh, and again, I'm not sure if it's territorial or just out of spite, but they've been known to tear people's catches apart or just steal it, you know, in, in their fur traps or whatever. <laughs> there, there's a couple experiences of people having these things follow them when they were leaving these areas going for, you know, more populated area to, to get away from the encounters that were ongoing, uh, just creepy stuff. Uh, I would say fall though, fall. And sometimes depending on the year and, and I haven't had a chance to do a spreadsheet to see if it's odd or even years, but it seems like the odd years, the odd numbered years seem to be a little more, I don't know if it's by coincidence because I'm only sharing what's shared with me. You know what I mean? Right. So, but definitely the fall, you know, between let's say August 1st up here anyway, cause it's Alaska. We, you know, leaves are turning yellow in August. It sucks, you know, and by September they're all on the ground. But from August 1st through when the snow flies is when I hear the most about the aggressive come to your house, staring at your kids through a window, banging on your cabin, that kind of thing. That's to me, that's creepy. You know, any any creature coming in and fixating on your kids is not my friend. You know, I, I can't. Oh, I, I know what it looked like staring at me. And I can imagine what it was like for little kids seeing these things staring at them. You know, I could just imagine. God. But, yeah, definitely the fall when it comes to most of the encounters that I get shared with me. Uh, I would say 80% are in the fall during hunting, berry picking, things of that nature, where there's more people out in the woods trying to, you know, trying to gather resources. What about reports of what, you know, people have termed samurai chatter? Do you have a lot of that going on up there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I've spoken to several people actually just in the last week, you know, where they were hearing things right out of earshot but just hearing enough and it sounded like gibberish and when they heard heard it more clearly it sounded more like chinese in origin versus you know someone speaking english mm -hmm. so it's kind of like a weird gibberish but yeah definitely plenty of that reported plenty of that have you ever heard that yourself uh, yes, I have, but it, it didn't sound like samurai chatter. It sounded like gibberish just out of earshot, just like, uh, especially in the wind with the wind blowing. It was years ago now, but the, the last time I had it happen, I was in Sunshine Valley way back up in there. Uh, that's northwest of Aleknagik. And it, it was so creepy. It, it sounded like children speaking gibberish just uh, just out of eyesight and just within hearing range but you couldn't make out what they were saying and when i got closer to what i thought was the origin of the area i thought maybe there was some other hikers you know out there berry picking or whatever and their kids got lost so i you know just want to make sure everyone's safe going over there and all of a sudden you hear something moving off and you hear that gibberish and it's just ah uh, and then once the hair stands up on your neck, you, you realize, wait a minute, okay, I don't want to be here. I'll just back out of here and, and go away. Mm, that had to be creepy. Oh, very creepy. Oh, just, I'm, getting, I'm getting the goosebumps just thinking about it right now. Especially when most of the time it seems like you're by yourself when you're out there doing this kind of stuff, right? I mean. Well, I, you know, when I go on, on like, legitimate expeditions for this channel i always bring at least one other person if not a couple um just for security reasons uh but a lot of times i go around the matanuska valley here and again anywhere outside of anywhere near my home I, I'll, I'll go by myself on my wheeler and i will just go to a, a secluded area do my filming for the channel and call it good but even here, you know, we're we're in a fairly populated area in the Matsu Valley between Palmer and Wasilla. And I filmed uh, juvenile tracks, a juvenile trackway, 1.6 miles from the Palmer Fishhook Road. And a lot of people live over there, you know, and some would say if they if they're curious about that, it's called Tracks in the Wild. That's the, the title of that video. But. I showcased the mid tarsal break, the length of the toes, you know, all that stuff. And I also, these tracks are a day old and I'm 200 pounds. So I, I'm showing in the video where I'm on one foot trying to make a dent in this mud that's relatively soft. 
and these tracks i mean it had to be four or five hundred pounds or so to make the depth of these tracks wow. you know and just creepy stuff alaska is a wild place I, I tell you that much you know there's a lot of historical stuff outside of willow you know a lady was tormented to the point where she committed self-harm and is no longer with us you know her name was beverly you know she was a waitress at a restaurant gosh and it makes me wonder about other people who have been tormented there, there's a lady miss carol she she doesn't even stay at her house you know her husband's buried on that property but she's been harassed so much you know she had 18 inch tracks that were like eight or nine inches wide right outside her house oh god yeah, and she was there by herself. You know, me and Squatch Bait went there a couple times just trying to come up with a game plan, IR floodlights, you know, things of this nature, so she could have peace of mind and be able to enjoy her, you know, the rest of her time in this world in peace. And, you know, we haven't we haven't found that remedy yet, you know, so she stays up in North Pole with her daughter and, you know, we'll go back briefly for a weekend or so every every summer, but since her husband passed, you know, four or five years ago, each trip back has been shorter and shorter because it seems like as soon as she gets back to her house, she no long, no sooner unpacks and the harassment starts. The banging on the roof, tapping on the wall, tapping on the windows, you know, things of that nature that just crazy, creepy stuff. What, did that activity start after the husband passed away or had they always had that? Uh, it had started when her husband got real sick. Oh. Again, vulnerability. Yeah. You know, it seemed like vo some type of vulnerability draws these things in. And I don't know if it makes easier prey, which would make sense. You know, lions go for the weak and the old. You know what I mean? So I, you know, the, the activity there started with uh, root balls from small shrubs and grass being thrown up on the roof shortly before her husband passed. And then after that, you know, it, it just steadily increased. That is interesting, though. So the husband gets sick. He's likely not moving about outside very much. Maybe he's even bedridden. I don't know. I'm not trying to pry. But, you know, at that point, they immediately notice that, which means they're watching. Uh, of course, we know that they do. And then they're going, oh, well, now she's seemingly by herself so now we're going to harass her that's really unfortunate though that's really sad because right. it sounds like well, it's a place you that know, she that's loves the, that that's the same area of the copper river valley not too far from horse creek where i was telling you earlier about their oral tradition was one that these hunters saw these things with human skulls and bones at their feet wow you know so uh, i mean literally across the river is horse creek so uh you know it, it makes it rough and you know, who do you call for something like that? You know, there, there's no one to call. Yes, people can call me and share, but I, I can't I can't fix it. You know, I, I don't have the answers, unfortunately. It just seems like a, a lot of times in Alaska, the the MO of these things is and, and people don't seem it's not a messing with Sasquatch situation like in the jerky commercials. These are people just trying to live their lives and do their thing, and the Sasquatch are coming in going, F you, get out of my area. This is my place. Right. And a lot of Native women, they report being out berry picking and these things showing themselves, motioning them towards them, like, come here. Oh, God. Come over here. Yeah, no. can you imagine? You're out picking no. berries, just doing your thing, and all of a sudden it's, you know, 50 yards away motioning for you. Oh, God. Nope. No. And that's, and, and you've said it uh, several times, we'll not get the stories because these people are gone, but I don't need, you know, it's like one of those things you're like, I don't even want to think about what goes on. Like after they take, you know what I mean? Like, no, not good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, when I was stuck in that shack overnight, I, I kept envisioning the ways I was going to go. Yeah. I, I, I envisioned them smashing the place down because it was only five eighths plywood and two by four. And them just smacking me against a tree, and that was going to be the end of me, you know? Yeah, and that would probably be the best case scenario if they just dispatch you quickly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, you know, when I first started my channel, this this person reached out with this, oh, I astro projected. I talked to them. They forgive you. If you go to this alpine meadow, you'll know it when you see it. You bring a little basket of berries, you know, and, you know, they'll make friends. And I, I, immediately blocked that person i was like what are you talking about there's no way in hell i'm gonna bring my own seasonings 
to my own potluck, you know, <laughs> yeah. out, out there in the middle of nowhere. Uh, should I bring potatoes and garlic too? I mean, make a stew, a Fred stew? I don't think so. Nope, no, big bag of nope. I mean, hey, to each their own belief, but you're kind of going, well, see what you think after this happens to you, and then you go out with the berries and the Fred seasonings and see how, how, how things roll out for you. Right. And, and that's another thing. A lot of people who haven't never had anything bad happen in the woods, God bless them, that's great. And they, they get the wrong mindset that it'll never happen. And why carry a gun? Why why carry? I don't need that. And it's almost a level of arrogance, you know, for some people, because nothing has happened thus far. They feel it can't happen. You know, just just look at some of the TikTok videos with the mountain lions and the black bears or brown bears. All of a sudden they're going down a trail. They go down every day and all of a sudden, hey, right. there is a predator that don't give a shit what you believe. Well, Fred, I, I certainly appreciate you coming on and all of your time today. Can you please let everybody know where to find you and contact you with their encounters? Uh, yeah, Alaskan Hairy Man Project at gmail.com is my email for encounters in Alaska. Um, I only showcase encounters in Alaska. Um, I thought about expanding, but I have my hands full with what I got going on here at the moment. But um uh, I'm open to that in the future, but Subarctic Alaska Sasquatch on YouTube or Subarctic Alaska Sasquatch.com. And again, the interactive map on the website is embedded with my YouTube videos. So if you pick a spot you may be vacationing to and you see a pin near there, just hit that pin. It'll bring up the encounter video that someone had experienced in that area and kind of give you a heads up of potentially what could happen. In the opening credits of my videos, I leave my phone number and contact stuff there as well, so it, it, I'm easy to find. Well, and I'm going to track down a couple of the videos, the specific ones that you've mentioned uh, in in this episode. I'll make sure everything, of course, that Fred has mentioned as far as where to find him in the show notes. But yeah, I mean, please go to the site. And, and Fred, I have to say, it's a really clean, easy to navigate site. I was clicking through a lot of the encounters and things on there uh, and... Uh, the map is just a yeah. very cool aspect of that. So congrats on that. No, thanks to Dave, the tech guy. He He's the one that told me I needed to to join you on your podcast. He Because uh, well, I keep Dave. my head down. I'm, I'm kind of in my own lane. But Dave was like, no, into the fray, man. She does a great job. She listens. She talks. She doesn't just, you know, treat it like, you know, garbage or whatever. So, yeah, Dave, the tech guy, man, he's he's a saint. Well, thanks to Dave and thanks to you, Fred. And you're welcome back anytime. I mean, it sounds like you're constantly getting fresh encounters of not only Bigfoot, but little people as well. So you're welcome back anytime. I appreciate that, Shannon. Thanks for having me.